Listen, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, okay, so I'm a pastor. I know what to do, but I would love to go to this Bible study. You can't. I understand that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do understand that as well. Uh, but I do want to tell you, I would love to go to this Bible study. So please don't miss out. Seven weeks. Okay. What? Do it for Darren. Oh, yeah. Do it. You know, however, whatever gets you there. Whatever gets you there. Just go. Okay. So we are in the book of Joel. Ooh, man. I, I can't remember what Neely said, but, something, but when she was, but uh, her exact words, but um, I, I do know that, you know, people are tired and they are exhausted and they are spent, and they are, if you notice, even, even the godly, they're getting more and more triggered, more and more discouragement, right? Depression around everybody, isn't that true? Haven't you noticed it? it look, if not you, wonderful, but it's got to be in people around you. You have to see it, right? Listen, can I tell you, that's, I hate to say this. Listen, I'm not trying to be doomy gloomy, because I have Jesus, so no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I am found in Christ Jesus. And he will take me home one day and I will be with the Lord forever. So no matter what happens to me, I am safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. Now, with that being said, so many people hurt and struggling. It can really bring you down, right? And there's going to be, I think, it's personal, this is opinion, that it's going to increase. It does say that in the last days, the heat's going to be turned up, and you're going to see a great falling away. Because, oh, this is just too difficult. Let's be honest, it's okay to think it once in a while. Man, I just want to run. Have you ever thought that? Yeah. Just want to stay home. Just want to run. Just want to quit. Just want to surrender. Give up. Right? I think that's okay to think. It's wrong thinking. It's stinking thinking. But it's okay to, to wrestle with that and say, no, no, I, I am sticking with Jesus no matter what. Okay? But the bottom line is, it's going to increase. So you, I, we have to choose in our eyes, in our minds, in our hearts, that we're going to walk with Jesus no matter what. No matter who goes with or who falls away, I'm going to follow Christ. Does that make sense? I can't make that decision for you. Right? Your husband, your wife, your kids, no one can make the decision for you. You have to make it. But God willing, you be the one that follows Christ Jesus until he comes again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Mark, we just started. You just got back. How could you already want to say something? Oh. Sorry, me? This? Okay. Sorry about that. All right, Mark, my friend. There you go, bro. And I saw a couple hands up there. I don't know if you were hallelujahing back up there, which is great. But if you want to talk, just raise your hand. You know, there, there will be people that will fall away. However, there will be people that will repent and return mm -hmm. to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they need to know where to come. And if we, as his children, are bearing fruit, they will see the fruit in us and through us and want what we have. So let's be those people that bear fruit and pray for those that will fall away, but also pray for those who are returning and repenting and needing to know where Jesus Christ is. Amen. That sounds like a perfect segue to what I was going to talk about. We got one more in the back. So, yeah. Maybe I just won't even teach today. We'll just let you You guys, this is good. That's just good. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. One more in the back. Yeah. Hey, God, the Holy Spirit speaks to each one of us. Isn't that true? That's okay. So if God puts something on your heart and you want to share it, we want to be open to hear what God is saying. Okay? So, yeah, feel free. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says this. This know that in the lost days, perilous times shall come. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to read the verses, you'll realize what it says, that we are living yeah. in the lost days with perilous times. 
So very true. Yes, you got one over here. Okay, we got one more. If you can bring it uh, past that microphone. Oh, sorry. The people at home, we got more people watching. So, Sunil, go ahead. Are we in the last days? That's a great question. I think the Lord, if you're, at, this is an opinion now, okay? I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord, okay? But I think that uh, we are living in the last days. It's certainly my personal opinion. I, I have been in ministry for almost full time ministry for about 30 years. I have never seen it like this before. The spot where what's going on, the country. Listen, if, if, if I was teaching, and I was 20 years ago, and I was saying something like, there's going to be, you know, hey, there's going to be a, a thing where you're not going to be able to go in and eat somewhere. You're not going to be able to go places unless you have the mark of the beast. People were like, that's really, how can that ever take place? Do you know there are certain states right now that you can't even go in and eat unless you have. Now listen, this is not a vax, anti-vax thing. This is simply an example. So don't write, you're an anti -vax. You can't go in with a vax card. We, we wanted to visit some friends of ours. Um, uh, they're, they're doing uh, work in uh, Japan, counseling military, and we were going to uh, go over there for a little bit. And uh, we can't because they require uh, we ha you have to be vaccinated. Or a uh, special trip that I wanted to go with my wife to Hawaii. She's always wanted to go. And that's what we was, we had just to say. So, and, and we can't, there's a lot of places, things now we can't do. Now, this is just right now. So, and I think it's going to get worse. I think we just have to accept that. And so we can either stomp our feet and, or just say, you know what? I'm just going to draw near to the Lord. I'm going to go all out for him right now. Because people need to hear. Amen? Amen? And so regardless of whether it's today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, two minutes, the Lord wants us living like it's the last days today. Yes. Right? Yes. So listen, you don't know what tomorrow brings. And we're going to talk about that at the end of today's sermon. And what Mark was saying was absolutely correct. But there's going to be folks that are going to be returning to the Lord. Could not be happier. There are people that are going to be repenting. Right? Could not be happier. And if, if you look in your, in your Bibles, we, we're in first Joel, first Joel. We're in Joel chapter 1. Verse 13. Hopefully you have your Bible. You should always have your Bible. You have your Bible. I have my Bible. <laughs> oh, I love this group. I love you guys. And I love that you're asking me. So yes, I do have my Bible today. And I don't know if your Bible says this, but above the verse 13, it says a call to what? Lamentations or repentance. Okay? All right? And so, repentance. Now, that's what my Bible says. My NIV says a call to repentance or to lament or to mourn. And, and so, that's how it starts off. Listen, repentance is simply a recognition of your sin, okay, followed by a heartfelt sorrow that we talked about last week. There's a worldly grief that leads to death, but there's a heartfelt sorrow, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, a change of mind, a change of heart that culminates in a change of behavior. So listen, God is saying, make a U-turn right now. And, and, and if you notice, he's, he's talked to four people in this first chapter. He talked to the, the elders, the leaders of the community. He talks to the partiers. He talked to the elders in, in verse 2. He talked to the, the partiers in, in, in verse 5. He, he, he talked to... Um, the, uh, the, the blue collar workers, okay, in, uh, in verse uh, uh, 11, the farmers and such. And now he's going to talk to the priests, the ministers, those who are following the Lord. And, and, and he's calling them to repentance. Listen, the Bible says judgment starts in the house of the Listen, don't be always so concerned about what they're doing. They're these worldly people. Listen, I get it. The worldly people are acting like the world. Right. Listen, I didn't get saved till I was about 30. Guess what? I, I was one of those worldly people. <gasps> yeah. 
well, so were you if you're really saved. You weren't thinking right. You weren't acting right. Right? Okay? So don't be as concerned. Point, point, point. Listen, if you want to point to someone first, can I encourage you as a Christian what God really wants you to do? He wants you to look at you. Don't look at your wife. Don't look at her. Don't, don't do it. I know you want to. <laughs> don't. Don't look at him either. Don't look at your kid. Right? Don't look at me that way. You look at you. And then you know what? You help one another with a helping hand. Say, hey, I want to get this right in your area, in your, in your life. Do you know what I'm saying? The repentance starts here. It's almost like, I was going to say it's almost like we're living in the last days. <laughs> we are living in the last days. But a, a lot of churches, and, and um, thank God this is not one of them. And, and there are others uh, that are not that way as well. Thank God. Um, but there's a lot of churches that ta think like repentance is, is just a, an old, old Testament term. Right? This is, it's an old time thing. Times have passed. We don't need to talk about sin, repentance. We're in the New Testament days. We follow Jesus and he just loves everybody. And we prance through the posies <laughs> full of love and balloons. Hug me. Listen. Uh, Jesus, when he started his preaching. Okay, this is when he first began. All right? This is Jesus. Right? All right, listen. Here's what he had to say. Okay, this is not an Old Testament thing. This is an all around, all the time thingy, especially in our hearts and the hearts of the Lord. For, he says from, from uh, then on after this is after he went out into the wilderness. Uh, you know that story, tempted by Satan in every way. And he stood on the word of God. It says in Matthew 4, 17, he says, from then on, he began to preach. And this is what he preached. He said, what? Repent. Repent of your sins. That means have a change of mind, have a change of thought, have a change of your thinking, have a change of direction. I'm going this way. This is what I like to do. Good worldly stuff, not for the Lord. And he's saying, make you turn and start doing things for the Lord and start tracking -track for him. Because it says, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it's now nearer than ever before. Okay? Listen, here, well, pastor, that was just at the beginning of his preaching. Well, okay, how about after he went up to heaven? This is in the book of Acts, friends. It says in Acts chapter, oh, I think it was Acts. Let me double check. Yeah, Acts 319. Okay, good. He says to, uh, this is the disciples teaching, says, and repent then and turn to God. And here's the reason. It's not just a, a, a mean word, God is trying to cause you to repent because he doesn't like you to have a good time in your life. No, he's saying repent then, turn to God, and here's why, so that your sins may be wiped out. <laughs> Completely wiped out. That times of what? Refreshing. Oh my God. If I need to be refreshed by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, now more than ever, oh, cleanse me, oh, refresh me, oh God. Renew my strength, Lord. So repent, you, you repent. Now I realize it's easier to look at somebody else or the news or something, but look at you, look at yourself first. Say, God, what do I need to repent of? Right? If we would all do that, we'll all be working on things in our own hearts. Listen, this is even in the book of Revelation. He's saying this to Christians. Okay, this is in, uh, uh, in the book of Revelation. He's talking to the church of... Processing, standby. That's what I was thinking, but I was afraid to say it. Would you look it up for me, Dan? I think, I think it is. It's in chapter 2. I think it's Laodicea. I, I, I knew it yesterday, but my ADD brain forgets. Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5. And he's talking to the church and he's saying, hey, man, you're, you're doing good in these areas and you guys are doing good in areas. But he says, I have this against you. You don't love me or you don't love each other as you did at first. He says, I want you to remember how far you've fallen. Don't be self-righteous, right? We've all fallen. And then he says, repent and do the things you did at first. Listen, it all comes down to this love God and love people. 
Listen, you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. You love others more than yourself. You be a servant to them. Does that make sense? Was it Laodicea? No, who was it? Revelation chapter 2? Ephesus. Ephesus? Oh, yeah. Ephesus. Like I said, Ephesus. <laughs> I thought it was Laodicea. Okay, anyway, Revelation 3.19 says, listen, those whom I love, listen, a lot of churches don't even share this stuff, but this is part of following Christ. Those whom I love, God says, are rebuke and discipline. Listen, can I just tell you something? I get disciplined by the Lord a lot. I don't like that, but I know he loves me. If a parent let their kid do whatever they wanted to do, that just shows that they're just a little lazy. They don't care about them. You discipline those. You, this is, he says, so be earnest and repent. Listen, all right. So he starts off here. Look at me with verse 13. I'll read verse 13 and then we'll exit you. He says, put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. He starts off calling the priest, the, the word there, well, actually, the first thing it says is put on sackcloth. Does anybody know what sackcloth is? Yeah. What is it, Chris? Well, it's a really rough kind of Yes. Right. Yeah, it's like bur burlap. Bur burlap. Yes, it's it's a rough material they used to. Use. So it is really, really uncomfortable. Sackcloth is it's almost like it's itchy. It and and you know putting on. Uh, I've got a little picture here, but putting on sackcloth. You know, um, in the Old Testament time was like a symbol of, of like mourning and of repentance. And in this material was made to be unpleasant to your flesh. And it was almost a, an outward way. Of, and, and actually, you'd also put, I don't know if you can see this right here. They, usually they'd say ashes. And the sackcloth would mean I'm just dying to my flesh. I just, it's, it's agitating to my flesh because I want to be closer. And the ashes it was almost a symbol of desolation. Sometimes they would sit in it. Sometimes they'd sprinkle ashes on their forehead. Just, I, I'm, I'm in total despair and helplessness, Lord. Everything's burned up. I need you. And it was a sign of repentance, okay? It was an outward sign or a demonstration of an inward condition of humility and repentance towards God. It wasn't the act of putting on the sackcloth and the ashes itself that moved God to intervene, but it was the humility that such an action demonstrated because you were telling the world, I'm a sinner, I've messed up. You know, there's a lot of times when we ask for prayer and, and, and if people want to be prayed for, and you know what, they, they need prayer, but they don't put their hands up. Right? They're too embarrassed or too whatever. They don't want people to think, you know what? Put your hand up when you need prayer. Mm -hmm. Bolt my hands up every time. Can I just tell you if you don't know what to pray for? Me, I'll take it. I can always use it, always. Putting on the sackcloth and ashes, it's just, it's just an hour. You, you're I don't care who knows. I, I need help. I need prayer and I'm okay with it because I'm here for God. Does that make sense? And it says that that... Um, yeah, it was David, okay? When, when we demonstrate that humility to God, okay? Um, it's almost like a little, in, in this, in Psalm 30, verse 11, David said this, you know, when, when he, he repented, he put on the sackcloth and ashes and he repented before God and, and God ended up touching his heart over time and he says, you turned my mourning, my grieving, my wailing into dancing. Maybe you remember the song? You've turned my... Anyway, it's an old song. He says, you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Amen? What'd you say? Joy. That's right. That's right. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. So instead of having that sackcloth, so he's telling the priests this. And, and that word uh, for priests, 
is uh, Kohen, and it basically means it's like the spiritual rulers. It's priests, or we would be like the pastors. Be like me and Pastor Gary. He's talking to us first. He's saying, repent, dude. And then it goes on and says, I want you to mourn and grieve. Quit looking at everybody else. Look at your own issues. It says, wail, you who minister before the altar. Come spend that night in sackcloth. And then it says in, in verse 13, you who minister before my God. That's a different word. You who minister before my God. The word in Hebrew is sharath. Sharath. And it means servant. So those of you who serve before my God. So listen, here's what that means. God is calling the worship team. You know what he's saying? Guys, I want you to repent. I want you to look in your life to find out what's going on. Those of you who are on the computer, the soundboard, I want you to repent. And I want you to look in your life. He's saying those of you who work in the children's ministry, wonderful children's ministry workers, happy to give themselves to love, pray, teach the kids. I want you to repent first. All you teachers, Lisa at the school, Kimberlina, I saw you here. Wendy Joe, I know you're watching online. Gary, I, I, I saw you here early. Listen, Neely, somewhere, yes, Nileza, Nileza. He's saying, I want you to get your heart right first. And you, all you who serve the Lord. He says he starts with you. Peggy, is there anything that you want to say? Okay. He says he starts with me. He starts with you. So don't worry so much about the other person. Worry about asking God to help you to change your heart and mind in an area of your own life. Because can I tell you, we're a body. And... And what I do or what I don't do affects others in here. Do you know what? I'll be honest with you. If other people are out serving and helping, you know what? Can I tell you? I feel blessed. I feel encouraged. I feel so. If, if, if other people's aren't, I feel too. Oh, man. You each have gifts that the Lord has given you. You're either using them or you're not. We're all made to be a body. Some are the finger, I'm like the elbow, or the big mouth, whatever you want to say. But we're all intertwined. You can't just be an island on your own, folks, especially folks at home. You can't be an island. He's made us to be together as a body. We have different gifts and abilities, even different workings of gifts, the Bible says. So he wants each one of us to be right, and he'll strengthen us as a whole. And he's saying that, listen, the fields are dried up. Everything's gone. Now, you, if, even if you wanted to, to worship the Lord, you can't. There's nothing to give. Because the locusts have come and they've ravished everything as judgment. It says in verse 14, look it with me. He says, declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. It says declare a holy fast. Now, um, okay, now I'm going to be honest with you. I'm very, I want to be very real with you always. Okay, I've got a lot of good spiritual disciplines. Okay, this is, when it says call a holy fast, can I just be honest? Fasting is probably one of my very weakest areas in my spiritual walk. Did you just say it looks like it? Dude, I can't wear live on live TV. You said I can't believe what are you saying? The the point is now when I hear about fasting, you know, I got a lot of questions that people ask, okay? And so I'm not the aficionado. Some other folks in here are, are probably better at that than me, okay? Uh, but when they ask what is biblical fasting and what it is not, okay, here's really quickly what it is and what it is not. First off, a biblical fasting is not a way to lose weight. Okay, and listen, there's nothing wrong with fasting to do that. 
Okay, but you have to understand that is not the purpose of fasting. Yep, fasting, hoping to shed a couple pounds. Woo! Oh my gosh. <laughs> I feel good. <laughs> See? Don't fast to lose weight. That'll keep you awake. Anybody who's dozing off there for a second? Thank you, George. But it's not a way to lose weight. That's not the purpose of it. Okay? Fasting is a way to take your focus and attention off of the flesh and the worldly things and onto spiritual things of God. Does that make sense? Listen, if you lose a couple pounds, okay. But that's not the point of it. Now, the world will have you fast, and then that can be a good cleansing thing, but you're not doing that to draw near to the Lord. Let's just be honest. So don't put that in your head. Biblical fasting, when he's calling them to fast, he's not saying, God's not saying, hey, repent, lose weight. But that's almost like what a lot of people think today, and that's not it at all. The focus of fasting is to draw near to God, and, 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 and that's the main thing, to draw closer to him, to hear what he's saying, to, to, to help with the decision, not just to get what you want. It's to seek God's guidance. Um, uh, maybe you, you, you're just exasperated, and you don't know how to handle this problem, and, and you prayed about it, and you're not getting anything. Well, then you can start fasting, Right? Or maybe it's you need help in a certain area, or or I'm just showing my repentant Lord. I'm just going to spend this extra time to draw near to you. I want to to hear you more clearly. I want to gain more focused attention and dependence on you, Lord. That's what fasting's about. And it's also a way, like here, of especially in the Old Testament, it was a way to express your humbling and repentance before the Lord. Now, Elijah, you had. Uh, I already lost the microphone. Don't even know where it is. But thank you. Um, but uh, did you have something that you wanted to say? You already okay, good. Okay, so now a lot of times fasting and prayer are linked together, okay? So fasting and prayer usually linked in the Bible. There was a, a, a woman in the temple when uh, God had spoke to her that she was going to see the Messiah, and it says that, and, and she, she was in the temple all the time, and, and it says she never left that temple, uh, the temple of God, but she stayed there day and night worshiping God, fasting and praying, so that one day she would see the Messiah. That's in Luke chapter 2, verse 37. Another time, the disciples were... Um, up on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and right before their eyes they saw Jesus and his, he was transfigured before them and it was like lightning and, and, and he had a couple of his disciples up there, a few of his disciples and, and they were blown away and then Moses and Elijah showed up and, 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 and then when they came down the rest of the disciples were trying to cast out demons and, and things like that this couldn't, there was a, a, a dad that was there and, and the disciples couldn't do it and and this one was particularly strong, and he would cause him to throw himself into the fire, the lake, hurt himself. And that's what a demon always does, by the way. Always wants you to hurt yourself. Listen, God always wants to rescue you. Just for the little record, a demon always wants to hurt you. So if you're ever having those thoughts, maybe about hurt yourself, right? Or maybe, remember the, the demon at the Gadarenes? It said that he was in chains, he would cut himself all the time. That, that's of the enemy. Don't you listen to him. Your Lord loves you and cares about you, right? But anyway, getting back to the story. And this dad was pleading and, and, uh, and then Jesus cast out that demon, right? And, and, and the disciples were like, why couldn't we do it? This, we, we did our normal stuff and usually they leave. And, and he said uh, this, and this is in, uh, in Matthew, I think is chapter 17. He said, but this kind of demon won't leave except by prayer and fasting. Okay, and so sometimes they're linked together. Now, fasting usually has to do with abstaining from food, right? Which obviously I'm not very good at. But you could abstain from other things. And, and, and here's the idea. So for example, let's just say 
you were going to fast, you decided whatever, you want more guidance or clarity on a decision or you're, you're really feeling like you're shackled in this area and it's, it's got a hold on you. So, so maybe you're going to fast your lunches for the week. And instead of Right, going out to Applebee's, stuffing your face, or you know, eat, you know, eating your two sandwiches, or or if it's Elijah, your seven hot dogs and <laughs> or eight orders of fries, whatever it is. Instead of you know, I'm going to go sit in my car. I'm going to go sit in. I'm going to drive somewhere, sit in my park, and I'm going to just spend time in the Word. I'm going to spend time in prayer. So I'm going to purposely give up what I want in the flesh because I want to be fed. I want that donut. I want that sandwich. You know what I mean? I want to feed my flesh. But instead, God, I'm sacrificing that because I want to draw near to you and I want to spend time with you and I want to be strengthened by you. Does that make sense? So you're purposely giving up things of the flesh. Or maybe you, every Friday, I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to do, fast for, from food or whatever. And, and I'm just, that's, but you can fast from, now this is going to be, hold on, hold on to your seats, especially if you're younger like myself maybe you could f maybe you should fast from social media oh! Whee! Whee! and it's not just that you're not doing something like for example when I grew up in church this is hey you don't eat meat Fridays that's what we do you love God? No meat on Fridays okay I don't eat meat well then as I got older and why? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> well, we just don't eat meat on Fridays. It makes us... No, no, that doesn't... It does nothing. It just means you don't eat meat on Fridays. Listen, what you want to do is you're putting off the flesh. If you don't want to eat meat on Fridays, but you then draw near to God during that same time that you would be scarfing your face. Maybe you come home every day from work, first thing you're on, phone, Facebook. You're on Insta. Graham, you're on Twitter, whatever it is, you know what, I'm not going to do that. And instead of doing that, I'm going to read, oh, there's one more copy. I'm going to read that not a fan book. Okay, it's harder for me to read. I get it. I'd rather be on Instagram. That feeds my flesh. I see what my friends are doing. I'd rather, how about I draw near to the Lord instead so you're giving that flesh stuff up, putting on that sackcloth. It's unpleasant to your flesh, right? But I'm going to do it for you, Lord. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes. So you could fast from social, you can fast from Netflix. <laughs> Here's one for you younger. How about YouTube? But again, you're giving up something of the flesh, but then you're putting on, you know what? I'm going to start. Here's what I'm going to do. I really love resting when I come. I, every morning, I get up and I watch blank. Worldly show. Or every evening when I come home, blank. World, how about I spend time in the Word instead? You see what I'm saying? You could do that. Or how about instead of, I really, here's the deal. Those Tuesday nights women's Bible studies, you're going you, you're gonna to be more comfortable if you just stay home. You can put your feet up, right? You deserve it. Just watch a little TV. You could. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? But maybe you say, God, I'm going to give that up. And I'm going to put in the time. And I'm going to take that Bible study. And I'm going to be strengthened. And then you're going to strengthen others. Make sense? Yes, question. No, uh, Jesus says when you fast, not if. Okay, that's a I'm good point. Sure. You're, you're, you're on the right track. You are on the right track, and you're okay. Uh, we will get to that. So, yes, yeah, so here's something else. Fasting is not a demand of the Lord. Okay. The Bible doesn't command that Christians fast. However, in the book of Matthew, it does say, and I'll talk about this in a second, oh, there's almost an expectation that, yeah, you're going to be fasting if you're a Christian. You're going to be praying. But the Bible presents fasting as something that's good for us and profitable for us and beneficial to us, okay? So, it, I don't have time to do it. There's, there's just too, too many. 
and I used the wrong font, and so I'm just realizing this is all not going to fit on the screen because I got Old Testament, New Testament. But David fasted when, and he, when he mourned the death of his child in 2 Samuel. And Elijah fasted when he was fleeing from uh, Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 19. Daniel fasted to understand and to, more, to understand a vision that God gave because he didn't understand. Esther fasted on behalf of her people and, and, and wept before the Lord. Ezra did the same thing. He wept for their sins and he, and he mourned and he, and he fasted for them. Nehemiah uh, did the same thing over the broken walls when they were being repaired. The people of Nineveh, when, when now I'm afraid to go over here now. <laughs> When Jonah preached, when Jonah preached to them, it says that they repented in sackcloth and ashes. So they even put, they went so far as put sackcloth on the animals where everybody's repenting. Right? In fact, Jonah was kind of mad about that because those people were very ungodly people and he kind of wanted the hammer to fall. God's like, they're repenting. I'm rejoicing. Jonah, you got the wrong heart. And it's the same in the New Testament. It's not going to fit on here. But yeah, Jesus did uh, in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, he did as well. Also, uh, the disciples of John the Baptist did in, uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 15. Cornelius did in Acts chapter 10, 13. And then also Paul, I think, in Acts chapter 9, verse 9. So there, you see a lot of fasting. But again, there is an expectation. It says this, Natalie, in the book of Matthew. It says, but when you fast, you don't, don't put on a show. You know, when you fast, not if. When, comb your hair, wash your face, and no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. So when you fast, it's not like, hey, do you want to go out to, to lunch today, Natalie? Can't do that. I'm drawing near to the Lord fasting. <sighs> You would just, you know what? Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. Love to go with you. Maybe next week. Okay? You don't need to make it all about you. Your purpose is to draw near the God. M make sense? Listen, even in the book of Acts, when they were making super important decisions, so, so Pastor Gary, you can hold me accountable. Lester, you can hold me accountable. Help, help me with this. This is a weak area, like I said. This is in Acts chapter 12. It says, one day... Um, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Acts chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And it says, in, back in Joel, and it says in that last, look in that last sentence, see in verse 14, it says, and cry out to the Lord. That word in, in Hebrew is, is zeak, and it means literally, it means to, to shriek or to cry out loud, like in anguish together. It's almost like he's saying repent, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but he's like, dude, have, have you ever been, you know you've messed up and you're coming back to the Lord, and you're just... Like uh, wailing, like you don't care who sees. You, if you're alone and you're you're just crying, you're like, Lord, help! Have you ever been there? Yes. If you haven't, good, but you'll probably get there. I have. That's what he's like. You're Lord. I'm so sorry. I've screwed up so many times. Please help me. That's that word is in Hebrew in verse 14 when it's saying. Zach, in Hebrew, cry out anguish and repentance. It's the same word used in Psalm 145, verses 5 to 7. Isaac. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the picture. That's the, it's a person who's repented. Whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it takes in my life, I want to have victory over that sin. I don't care. Anything. Do what you need to do in me. Whatever it is. Because that's a real repentant heart right there. It says, Isaac, I cry out to you, O Lord. I say, listen to this. You can hear the repentance. You can hear the desperation. I say, you're my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry. 
Can you hear it? I'm desperate need. Right? Can you hear him crying out in anguish? Rescue me from those who pursue me. They're too strong for me. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. You cry out to him. He's calling you. God is calling the people back then. He's calling you. Cry out to him. Jonah 2.2 I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. And what did he do? He answered me. Now, it may not be the right way, the way that you think he should, but he'll answer you. It says this in Psalm 34, 17. You know, we were talking about that time of refreshing, right? It says the righteous will cry out. And it says the Lord will hear them and deliver them out of their troubles. That's our God. Now, I don't know how, sometimes I don't like how the Lord delivers me from those troubles, but he will deliver them. Pastor Gary, how long have I been teaching? Okay. Jeez. Okay. Verse 15. It says, alas, for the day, excuse me, alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord, I have so many underlines, I can't read it. Thank you. The day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Lord Almighty. Okay, so just really quickly, I'm going to skim through this. I'm not going to go over all the Bible verses. So, okay. Now, when it talks about the day of the Lord, it's usually identifying events that take place at the end of history, but not always, okay? And so, like here, it says a key to understanding the phrases is to note that they always identify a span of time during which God personally intervenes in history, directly or indirectly, to accomplish some specific aspect of his plan. Usually like a judgment type thing, or a salvation type thing, or both, okay? So the, the phrase, the day of the Lord, is used often in the Old Testament, and uh, it's used in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Joel and Obadiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Malachi, and it's used also in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2.20 and 1 Corinthians 5.5 5, and 2 Corinthians 1.14, 1 Thessalonians 5.2, 2 Thessalonians 2.2, and also in the book of Revelation. In those Old Testament passages, the day of the Lord often conveys a sense of eminence, nearness, expectations. Like it will, you'll see it in Joel 2, 1, Joel 3, 4. It says, let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming and it's close at hand. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. We have that right now. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. It also calls that day of the Lord a day of wrath <laughs> or a visitation and the great day of the God Almighty in the book of Revelation 16, 14. And also, and it's when God's wrath is poured out on unbelieving Israel and the unbelieving world. The scriptures indicate the day of the Lord will come quickly. The Bible says it'll come like a thief in the night and be, people won't be prepared. So we need to be watchful and ready for the coming of Christ at any moment. Don't think, I think all these people, <laughs> Pastor, I'm just going to repent later when it gets closer. Man, the time is now. Now is the day of salvation, you know? And besides the time of judgment, it'll also be a time of salvation as God is going to deliver the remnant of Israel. He's going to fulfill his promise that Israel will be saved. The final outcome of the day of the Lord will be that the arrogant men and women will be brought low and the pride of men will be humbled and the Lord will be exalted in that day. Isaiah 2.17 and that final fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the day of the Lord will come at the end of history with the wondrous power and punishment of evil. And God's going to fulfill those promises. There's going to be sheep and goats. And man, you want to be on the sheep's side. Let me just say it that way. Lisa, can you wheel that card over to me? Ezekiel, can you help carry those glass things over so they don't break when she's moving it? Ignore the woman behind the cart. Verse 16, look in your Bibles. It says, has not 
the food been cut off before our very eyes. They were experiencing judgment in their day. It says the joy and gladness from the house of our God. It says the seeds are even shriveled beneath the clods. We don't know what that word clods means, the Hebrew term. But imagine this. Imagine all your food is gone. Think of Venezuela. Remember that socialist project that everybody said, all the Hollywood said, oh, socialism's great. It's gonna, oh, everybody's going to be doing And they couldn't even find food to eat when it was all finished. Right? Couldn't even find food. They don't, all their trees are dried up. Not only that, think about that. The seeds, there's not even seeds. They're shriveled. There's, they're, they're completely desolate. There's nothing left and there's nothing around the corner. They are hopeless, helpless without the Lord. It says, listen, even the storehouses are in ruins. In verse 17, the granaries have been broken down and the grain is even dried up. Listen, there is literally, absolutely nothing left for them. And I'm, oh, I'm looking for a Bible because I don't have it written down. Give me just a second. Oh, Lord, please help me find it. In Jesus' name. All right, it did. Thank you. In Luke, this is in Luke chapter 12, if you want to turn there, but... Sometimes we can think, we live in America, we're very prosperous, and we can think things are never going to go bad. Do you know what I'm saying? Listen, don't be so foolish. They, they, they lost their storehouses, they lost everything. And, and what's even worse than that, is Jesus told these, these people a parable, and, and he said, listen, he said, um, this is in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse, uh, starting verse 15. I'll just read it to you. He says, Jesus said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kind of greeds, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, listen, listen to this, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I'll big, build bigger ones. And I will store for my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy, right? Eat, drink, and be merry. Isn't that what the world says to you? You know it is. And then it says in verse 20, it says, but God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life, your suke, your soul is what that word means in Greek, will be demanded from you. Then who will get all that you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Listen, here's what I'm telling you. It's the opposite of the world. I get that. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, 19, you don't know when the, judge, when the judgment comes. You don't know. He says, this is, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen, the Bible says in Mark, well, what will it profit a man or a woman if you gained the whole world, but lost your soul, what difference does it make? Here's the deal, if I can, okay? Uh, yeah, do this, all right? Oh, I see what you wanted me to do. That was good. I get it. Picture this. I don't know if this is a good illustration. Elijah, you can zoom, zoom in on this. Okay, what do we have here? We've got, this is your work. Oh, my gosh, man. It's killing me. Maybe you should really pay attention to this. Huh? Did I? All right. Sorry about that, kids. George will fix that later. All right. So imagine this. This side is your worldly business. All right. Listen. Okay. Here first, and this side right here, this is actually, you know what? On my right. Right? Probably doesn't matter. Okay, it's kingdom business right here and worldly business right here. Okay? So imagine this. This is the little treasure that God gives you. Okay? This is the treasure chest. You're all given talents. 
you've been given a mind, a heart, desires, abilities, right? They're all different, right? These are the talents that God's given you. You've been given uh, things you know how to do. This is, this is your life. This is the treasures of your life. Okay, right? This is, and I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but it's full. Can everybody see that? I don't want to do it too much because it'll all spill out on the ground, right? This thing is full. He's given you, it's full of stuff. He's given you blessings and time and breath and abilities and whatever. And here's the deal. Here's your worldly business. Okay, we understand, right? You got to work, right? You got to work. You got to eat. You got to pay the bills, right? We, we understand this, right? It's good to save up, right? These things, right? You got time to spend. You can relax a little bit, can't you? There's nothing wrong with that, right? But you keep putting it in here and working towards, right? And you keep working towards stuff that doesn't matter and you're investing your time and your finances, right? Where are your finances going? Listen, this is not a ploy to get money. You give if you want to give. I'll never know what you give. You could give a million dollars here. They won't tell me because they want me to minister to everybody equally. God bless them, right? So it's not about money, okay? You have time. How We desperately need help. And you are taking all of the treasures that you have and you're spending... Oh, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. Yeah, that's good. And but but I need to do my stuff, Pastor. You understand, of course, because you know things need to happen, and you get it, don't you? And all of a sudden, you get the idea. And here you come to the end of your life or all of a sudden you have cancer or all of a sudden there's a whatever and you realize oh my god I have spent my whole life investing my time my talents my gifts the treasures that God has given you and I've spent them on myself. Oh my God. How about, listen, the goal is in this life, the world is telling you to do this. It doesn't matter if it spills over on this side. Who cares? Good, live it up. God is saying, oh, son, daughter, I, I created you for a purpose. You are either fulfilling my purposes or you're fulfilling your purposes. Stop, turn around, repent. Not because I love you. So a time of refreshing can come. And so that I may be glorified so that people may come to know me the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Listen, here's your goal in your life. Maybe you've done this and you've filled it up and you've wasted most of your life, whether you're 10 or 100, whatever. And now, whatever time you have left, you take as much treasures as you can or as much as your worldly stuff and you transfer the world stuff into kingdom business, into things that glorify God. Why am I getting so mad in this situation? Is it glorifying God? You know what? It is not. Do you hear what I'm saying? I need to transfer it into kingdom business. This, this other stuff isn't that big of a deal. Why am I doing it? No, I need to be spending it. I should go to the Bible study. I should, I should live like there's no tomorrow. I should... So that when he calls you home, you can cast those crowns and say, Dear Lord, I, 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 the talents I did have, I, I offer them to you. And, and I want to give them to you. That's the goal in your life. Take it out of the worldly business and put it into kingdom stuff. 
stuff that glorifies God, stuff that's what your life is about. Does that make sense? Listen. Here. The Bible says, a fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, so that he may be known. The world's going to get darker and stormier. Okay? Listen. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 18 and 19, for us Christians, this is a perfect picture. So listen, look at this picture carefully. Darkness, storm. But you have the umbrella of Jesus Christ. It says, let them, us Christians, do good. So that me, we may be rich in good works towards God in the kingdom business. Ready to give of your time, of, of, of your service, of your talents to the Lord. Willing to share storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, not the time right now, the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. And then the last verse says this, and then we'll, we're going to... The last verse says this, and I, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Just a second. This is in Joel. Verse 18 says, even the cattle are moaning. The herds are, um, are in the mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. And that word is a sham. And that means that they're, they're suffering. They're guilty of punishment. <laughs> they're, they're being included and they're bearing the guilt. And verse 19 says, in verse 20, I'll, let me just read this to you. And then I'm going to say what we're going to do. It says, to you, to you. O Lord, I call. Underline that in your Bibles. To you, O Lord, I call. That word is kara, and it means to invite, to call for. It says, to you, O Lord, I call. It says, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and flames have burned up all the trees in the field. In verse 20 says, even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Listen. Um, Miss Neely, I I'm so sorry to do this. You don't even have any idea. Can you come up here for a minute? Well, listen, H here's what I'm going to do. And it has to do with this verse. And listen, w you've been here long enough. I'm so thankful that you're here. And I'm so thankful if you guys are watching us at home. You grab your guitar. Thanks. I'm going to ask you to play something for a few minutes. All right. And, uh, when it says in verse 19, to you, O Lord, I call, that's a different word than cry out. It's inviting. So here's what we're going to do, okay? I'll get out of your way or whatever. Here's what we're going to do. And I don't know, be honest, I don't know if this is from the Lord or not, but it says this in, in Jeremiah 33, 3. It says, call to me and I will answer you. I'll tell you great and searchable things you don't know. It says in in it says in Psalm 50, 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. And then it continues on in Psalm 50, 16 says, but God says to the wicked, why bother reciting my decrees and pretending to obey my covenant? For you refuse my discipline and you treat my words like trash. Don't you do that. The greatest tragedy of life, F.B. Meyer said, he was a Baptist preacher with D.L. Moody, he said, it's not answered prayer, but unoffered prayer. So here's what we're going to do. That verse 19 says, he says, to you, O oh Lord, I call. To you, O oh Lord, I, I invite. Here's what I want. And, and, and I don't know if there'll be one person or no people, but I'm just going to do it. First off, in the earlier verses, it said to cry out. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a time, and I'm just going to ask who needs to be pray prayed for. Listen, here's the deal. Once I do this, and we start, if you want to quietly leave today, you do that. Okay, but what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to have everybody close their eyes and I'm going I'm to say, if anybody needs prayer, I want you to raise your hand and you keep that hand up high. You don't care who says what. You put on that sackcloth and ashes and you just say, I need, to I need help. I need prayer. I need whatever it is. Okay. In just a second, we're going to do that. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to ask for a second group of people and you guys are going to have to be bold too because I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to do it unless the Lord prompts me. I want you to do it. We're a body together. And I'm going to ask another set of folks to stand up and you go lay hands and pray over those people. Okay? So here's the deal. I'm going to have everybody, if you would, just close your eyes right now. And again, if you have to go as we do this, you are welcome to do this. But I'm going to first ask um, everybody with their eyes closed, heads bowed, please. If you need prayer, would you please, don't care about what anybody says, okay, don't even care. Listen, you do it for the Lord's sake, and you raise your hand high. Do you need prayer? Raise it high. Who cares what people think? That's it. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Raise those hands high, and keep them up there. People will get to you. I guarantee it. And now I'm going to ask, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the rest of you, you open your eyes, those who don't have their hands raised, and you stand up and you go pray for somebody with their hands raised. Right now, get up and you go. Ask the Lord which one and you start going to people. And you start praying for them and you keep those hands lifted high. And Miss Neely, would you just play a couple of songs for us, however you want to do it, while we sit and we pray for people. Just go around and start praying for people. In Jesus' name.